Welcome back to the Black Letter Podcast. We set out to create an entertaining and exciting podcast about law and business. Black Letter, the name, comes from the Gothic typeset. Over time, Black Letter became the only font that English law books were printed in. It made it harder for kind of the common person to understand what the English law books said. Black Letter came to represent something that was law, that was set in stone, that was sort of old and a well-settled fundamental principle of law. We're here to demystify black letter law. We're here to demystify things that happen in business and law and where those two meet. And I hope you have fun listening. Welcome back to the Black Letter Podcast. I'm Tom Dunlap, your host. And with me today, again, is Will Russell of russellmarketing.co. Russell Marketing is a product launch company. They launch services too, but their web pages. I asked him in the last show, Will, there are these really neat, successful, interesting products. I actually wanted to click on and buy one of them. The backpack wind turbine is like, I I need that. I don't know why I need that. He's raised millions of dollars, helped his clients obtain millions of dollars through his marketing product launch campaigns. And I asked him to tell us what like the secret sauce was. What was the one thing that stood out that these, these successful launches have in common and maybe what do the unsuccessful launches have in common? What, whatever it is. And he said he had many thoughts on that. So I hope to, to get the best ones of those many thoughts. And then we're going to ask Will about his, his major business struggle. So Will, th- welcome back. Thank you. Yeah, tell us what your thoughts are about this, these products campaigns you've been successful with, vice the ones you haven't been successful with. I would say... There's there's two things, there's many things, as I said in the last one, but I'm going to highlight two things that I that I think stand head and shoulders above anything else if you're about to launch your product or your business. Number one is the proof of concept. The number of people who invest a lot of time and a lot of money in ideas that have not been validated by the market is astonishing. And I don't mean asking family and friends. Family and friends are never going to tell you the truth. And I don't even mean, is this a good idea? Like, is this a problem that needs to be solved? And this is a solution to solve it. That's only one piece of the jigsaw because there's there's one thing is to create a solution for a problem. The second thing is to be able to produce at scale that solution at a price point that is both going to be satisfactory to the customer and also satisfactory to you. So... You can have a great idea that doesn't exist and is wonderful, but if it's set at a price point which no one's willing to pay, you're going to be in trouble. So anyone, I urge anyone who's launching a new idea or investigating a new idea or considering it to validate that idea in the market through either your own kind of mini funnels or stranger focus groups, any way you can validate, lots of good books on that. Validate that that idea before you go too deep down that rabbit hole because it's a hell of a cost you incur both with your anxiety, uh, with your finances, with your time. If you move forward with an idea that you could have found out right at the start wasn't going to be as successful as you wanted it to be. The second piece of it, let's just look purely at the most successful campaigns we've worked on and maybe those that have faced the most challenges outside of validating the idea. I would say with the product launch is just transparency and honesty of the founding team. There's a massive difference when a founder that we work with is upfront, honest, transparent, visible, responds to questions, interacts with prospective customers, interacts with customers, and really puts themselves front and center and holds that accountability for the success of their launch compared to founders who hide behind generic info at thisiscompany.com email addresses, position themselves as a brand rather than uh, identifying themselves as a founder. Now, long term, the brand needs to be the brand and the founder is going to be stepping away from, likely going to be stepping away from everything going through him or her. They're not necessarily going to be the face of the company forever. But especially a launch when you have almost no credibility, nothing to prove that you're going to deliver a product, nothing to prove it's going to be a good one nothing to prove you're going to satisfy your customers, the best level of trust you can, or the best lever of trust you can pull is face-to-face, human-to-human. You can, you know, you can trust me. And when people know you as an individual or trust you as an individual, they're going to be much more likely to take a risk on whatever it is you're launching. So, Will, how do you feel about brand spokespeople? And I'll just throw this out as something that um, struck me. So I have some 
some friends of mine that are no longer with this company, but they started a company called LegalZoom a long time ago. Mm-hmm. And Brian and Eddie and uh, and Brian, they all went to Robert Shapiro, who was a famous attorney who defended OJ. And they asked him, hey, will you be our spokesperson? And they, you know, that's how he got looped in. He, he did not come up with the technology to do document automation and processing, you probably guessed. And he did it. And really, I think that's what launched the company. Not that, I mean, you don't know who Brian Lee or Brian Lee or Eddie Hartman. You have no idea who those guys are. Those are the guys who started the company. But Robert Shapiro was the face of the company. If you recall, I don't know if you remember, but for the first like 10 years mm-hmm. in the early 2000s or mid 2000s, whenever it started. And it wasn't the founders. It was mm-hmm. they made a conscious decision to not be the brands on purpose because they didn't have any brands, I guess, equity. They were mm-hmm. IT guys lawyers, combination of that uh, with an idea. Does that land somewhere in the middle of the founder backing the idea versus being the brand? I mean, have have you seen that or how effective is that? Because I I wonder about that myself. I would would say that's absolutely effective. That's, you know, that's another lever of trust you can pull. If you have the connections or the financial uh, support to bring on someone that has a high level of credibility, I don't know if you you or your listeners or viewers know the Fire Festival, but obviously the Fire Festival was an example where he got a lot of influencers and paid them a lot of money. Yes. Just, and so it didn't was work like, out well though, right? Right, exactly. But he was like, oh boy, that credibility duped many people into spending. Yeah, a lot that of was money, manufactured right? credibility. Maybe not a good example for our listeners to follow that. No, no, that's <laughs> what I'm saying. Yeah, don't follow that. No. But it's an example of how you can acquire credibility. Uh, through third parties like that, I would say if you have the investment, I mean, Fire Festival did, and they got these people on board. And at the end of the day, they tried to sell tickets and, and they successfully did that with, the, with that credibility. I do think a lot of people we work with don't have those connections, don't have the finances to really right. bring on someone who has a meaningful level of credibility. Uh, and secondly, one of the things we see time and time again, especially with technical products, is as the nature or the close relationship between the marketing and the kind of the FAQs. So when you bring on a brand personality to present themselves as the face of the brand, if you're a small team in particular, you're probably not going to have the processes in place for your marketing team or individual or whoever to be accurately responding to some of the technical or product-related questions that will exist early on. Now, if you have VC funding uh, already in the bag and you've got a team built out, then sure, you might have those processes in place and you can do that. Many people don't. And what I see when that happens, if someone tries to bring on a, a face of the brand that doesn't have the founder knowledge or founding team knowledge of the product, you're going to start getting discrepancies between the marketing and the, what's being said versus the reality. And that, that can impact trust. So absolutely, if I can get, let's talk about English software. If I can get David Beckham to promote a product, I will 100% get David Beckham to promote a product. But David Beckham is unlikely to have the deep technical knowledge of that product that a lot of customers might want to know before taking a risk on that company. So they're both good good options, satisfy slightly different kind of needs. So business challenge, you started this business five years ago. Uh, you've had some success. We're, we're on the Forbes Business Council together. Tell me what business challenge, your most challenging business challenge, the toughest thing you've faced, either you or maybe a client business challenge that you helped them overcome that was what you think would be most useful to people listening right now, the best lesson you have. There were two things that came to mind as I was thinking through those options. And let me give two to you and you can tell me which one you think might be most relevant for your audience. Sure. Yeah. So one was when I first launched a business, it was a slightly different variation of this business and it was course training and it pretty much failed. So I can speak to that. I can also speak to a more recent challenge I've had, which has been a big challenge and continues to be a big challenge where I'm trying to scale revenue while not scaling a team. And in a service-based business, that's really tough. Which of those do you think might be most relevant for you guys? Well, I think they're both relevant. I, I mean, I, the first one, so so here's how I would, I would the question I would ask, the micro question about your first uh, challenge, because your second challenge is ongoing, and I'd like to dive into that more. But the first challenge, you said you started a business and it failed. Do you know why it failed? Wow. Did you test your product before you launched it? 
not as much as I should have. Yeah, I mean, that's probably, it's been a few years back now, but when I look back to that, I think there were two things which didn't help me. One was I created a bunch of training courses without sufficiently understanding if those were solving a problem that existed in the market in the right way. And the second piece of it was I had no credibility. Who am I? And I didn't really do enough to counter that. So that for many reasons, I probably wouldn't go back to courses anyway, even if, if and when I have good credibility and, and whatnot. But I think in that situation, yeah, I didn't come up with something that was a good enough solution for the particular audience I was looking at. And secondly, yeah. I didn't I didn't have the credibility to convince many people one person bought it. But apart from that, I didn't have enough credibility to convince people to buy it. That is a low uptake. So I'll say, just interestingly, we have a couple of clients that do um, large national courses, but they're almost exclusively academic courses. Mm -hmm. Like uh, we have one client that does all these math courses, like 50 different math courses, very big uptake, right audience, right product. But I think when it comes to things like marketing or law, like people don't want to buy law courses. They want a lawyer to do it. They want a marketer mm -hmm. to do it. Mm -hmm. And that's the market. I, it, it, it just sounds like to me, I, you know, I, I, can, I can see your experience. I feel that. Um, so second challenge you talked about, really mm -hmm. interesting, scaling revenue mm -hmm. without scaling personnel. And that yeah. you know, is always like the technology inflection, right? Like, is, is there enough technology in what you do to drive that? Do you need a sales team? Because there is a big human element, obviously, to what you do as well, I think. Mm -hmm. it sounds like it. So tell me about that challenge. Well, maybe two years ago, we had a team of nine, 10 people. And I, there's some good studies out there that talk about, you know, the true value of having small teams and how when you scale and you see, everyone sees it. We see it. We deal with a lot of clients. When a company scales, other problems come into the mix. And generally speaking, quality of service is going to take a hit. And we were growing and I just really didn't want, number one, to be a manager of a lot of people. That's not what I want in life. Uh, and Number two, I didn't want everything that entailed that scale, such as kind of performance dropping or quality of review dropping or anything like that. So I set about end of 2020, I guess, and made the decision, okay, I'm not going to scale the team anymore. Anything we do from now on to grow revenue has to be focused on something else, not to do with simply adding someone else to the team so we have more bandwidth, because that just goes on forever. So. We spent a lot, of, a lot of work over the last 18 months trying to do that. Things like ways we can create value from monetary value for us, but also value for, for the clients who previously we would have turned down. For example, clients without much budget. A training course is one way of people have attempted to do that. We haven't gone that path, but that's a way of increasing revenue without increasing capacity. Increasing average order values are the ways we can add on uh, services to our scope that really don't move the needle too much from a bandwidth standpoint, or is there value that we're delivering that we're really not charging for in, in how we present it? So we spent a lot of time and worked hard at that. Frankly, I'd have to say we struggled in, in 2021 to deliver on that. I didn't, the company was about stable from a revenue standpoint, which is fine, but as a young company, year over year, you expect to see decent jumps. And we didn't see that. And it was by design. I made the decision not to grow the personnel. And I accept the consequence of that was not really growing revenue like we wanted to. Uh, but I stand by that commitment. And so this year, we're going about it again, focusing on you know, different things, working different ways of how we can increase the value we're delivering, increase the different ways we can deliver value. Again, things like courses could be an option again in the future, but it's not really something I want to go down the path of now. I have a book coming out this year, which could be uh, an interesting option for that. But essentially working out ways and fine tuning, it's just a model, isn't it? If you're looking at your business, you're looking at the model, right. an Excel model. And what can I tweak? Which products are delivering the most bang for a buck? Which are the most profitable? Which are the products we need to drop because they're just not delivering the return? Uh, so that all in all, we see revenue grow, um, expenses stay stable. That's kind of the goal. And I'm just pulling all the levers I can to make that happen. So question for you. So looking at what you do in your five-step process, 
the first part of the process where you do this kind of channel vetting or this overall project product vetting where you get an idea of whether or not you think it'll be successful in the marketplace. Do you do any pre-vetting constructive analysis or constructive criticism? So just by way of example, we get company business plans. We don't do what you do from a marketing perspective, but we do diligence on the patents. Do you have any patents? Have you protected your brand? Do you have a trademark yet? Do you have trade secrets agreements with your employees? Do you have terms of use and privacy policy in your website? We go through this checklist of things with, with clients as part of, I guess, sort of business advising in conjunction with the legal work we do. Um, and I don't know if you do that, but that might be an area to, to think about an add-on to. I mean, you could partner with a law firm like ours, mm -hmm. uh, but you could also do something where you just provide a checklist and you tell them to do that on their own, but that could be a value added thing that wouldn't cost you much because it's really kind of a, a course yeah. or maybe yeah. maybe it's something to charge for hey would you like the pre-evaluation you know service the pre pre-vetting service or something like that i don't know just yeah. sort of interesting as i saw your products i also just immediately because i run our patent prosecution group and our trademark group thought is there a patent on that windmill thing and is there a patent on that clock or in the process involved with the clock and they what's the brand of that why is the brand flashing up do they have that protected are they protected in the US? Are they protected in the EU? Like all of these things flash through my mind, not a normal person's mind. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I think those are very relevant and valuable things that you might, you know, um, kind of value add to your service. I don't know, just thinking out loud. Yeah. What do you yeah. think? It's true. So, for example, with two new services we launched this year, that has Leave Us to Pull. One is yeah. called Launch Light, which is a much lighter system rather than our full launch system. And one is consulting where we offer a kind of consulting service and a sort of checklist like that is certainly a good idea we have a, a business development manager starting next week and i know i said you know we're not going to grow personnel however when i really look at when i looked at 2021 and i saw the time i was investing as the founder in business development and what that meant in terms of where i wasn't able to focus my time elsewhere i felt that we used to have someone in that role and then they left. Bringing someone back into that role was going to be critical to achieving this goal. So we have, you know, it's not that I'm growing the team team, but I felt that filling that role was super important. So we did bring them on. But their responsibility is going to be coming up with ideas like that, Tom. You know, how can we take the assets we have and turn them into something valuable? Checklist is certainly uh, one of those kind of options. We don't have quite the, the level of legal detail in our checklist as, as you went through, but yeah, we certainly do. It's specifically things that focus around us. Do they have any sort of online presence? Do they have any sort of branding? How many people are on the team? Do they have funding? Uh, what do they do? They have a day job or is this their full time gig? And these are the kind of, I mean, those are the checklists we have for kind of what makes a perfect client. But those gotcha. kind of things are easily adaptable for what makes a perfect launch, you know, and you can right. take those boxes. So that's a great idea. Yeah. Okay. Well, there you go. That's How much do I owe you? <laughs> Zero for that. Thanks for being on the show. So uh, we're going to come back in segment three, our next segment with you, Will, and I'm going to ask you for what three pieces of advice uh, would you give to a business? I mean, I get the vetting thing. I feel like that's number one. But when we come back next next segment, dwell upon that. And, uh, and, you know, we, we'll come back and tell our, our listeners and viewers what, what you've got. Thanks for joining us, uh, Will. And um, thank you, everybody, for listening to this segment, too, with Will Russell, Russell Marketing. That's all for today's episode of Black Letter. Thanks again for listening. Join us next time when we talk about more Black Letter issues in creative ways. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode. And check out our website at blackletterstudios.com.